Maggie Chow, principal experienced designer, and we should give her an extra big round of applause because after we asked her, she got a promotion. So well done, Maggie. Um, principal experienced designer at AQQA. Uh, Maggie has come from a graphic design background, but over the last 10 years, she's really moved heavily into user experience. Uh, AQ, AKQA explains themselves as the imaginative application of art and design. They have 23 studios across the world. Let's welcome Maggie to the stage. Thank you, Matt. Oh, cool. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Maggie. I'm from Melbourne, AKQA. I think not many of you know about me unless we have spoken just now or last night. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about myself first, then we'll get to about data-driven design. Oops. There you go. So who am I? I'm born and I grew up in a beautiful city called Hong Kong. So I have been there for who knows how many years and I always want to get out from there. <laughs> Not because of the environment, just because I want to explore. So I came to Australia in 2004 is for my study. So I, start, I started with um, graphic design. I studied in Brisbane and I stayed there for two and a half years until my first visit to Melbourne and I made up my mind at my first visit and said, I'm moving down there, I'm done. And 2007, I moved to Melbourne and did my postgraduate degree. On top of that, I have been artistic since I was a kid. A funny story is I often get my brother annoyed a lot because I like to scribble. And there was one occasion, I don't know what's, what came to me, I just used a red ball pen, I would scribble or on his magazine, on his posters and put a red lipstick on every single celebrity. So he was like, what are you doing? So that's how I discovered my artistic side. <laughs> but other than that, I also love photography. Not just implying that I love sweets, but this is one of the product shots I did for um, a small Japanese cafe in Melbourne. I love photography as in I can get to observe things through the lens, but through different angle. Other than photography, I like art and craft. This is one of the paper art I did for the art exhibition we had in our office last year. You might think it's just paper, but if you think about craft, the paper art is just an alphabet H, but it's actually implied, if you look at an art in different perspective, different angle, just look at the photos. One art, but incorporating with different lighting, you see a different form of an alphabet. That is an approach that we should always have as a designer, is thinking or solving problems, seeing problems, seeing opportunities from different angles. Don't just stick with one road and that's it, because you will never know what you find. So let's talk about how I get to where I am today. I know a lot of you actually is coming from a graphic design background, so am I. So I started as a graphic and web design from 2006. So I've been doing in print, I've been doing in digital, but I had a career change at 2011 as a UX designer at a corporation called Census. I have been within Census for about three years. I learned as much as I can that time because this is my first career change. I need to get that opportunity to learn as much as I can. And I'm glad I joined the company because they have a fully established um, 
agile process, I get to work closely with the product team and the development de developers team and to learn different things. And I was talking to one, um, some of the students saying that it's always hard to take the first step because my manager told me in my first job as a UXR, in my first user testing session, the feedback he gave me was, you know you're very nervous. I said, how, how do you know? I said, your hands were shaking. I could tell from the camera. And I was like, oh really? I thought I was doing just fine. But he also said that as a human being, when we are relaxed, we tend to lay back. But he told me during the whole section, I was leaning towards to the users, like I was really intimidating them. I said, what do you think? Why? Tell me this. I, said, I didn't realize because I am in that moment until you observe, you don't know how you do. So I've been doing UX designer from UX experience design from there until now, and I get to my principal role. These are just some of the um, business and clients I've worked with from academic, um, retails, telecom, superannuation, or government. And I learned different things through that because different business, they have different process and different requirements. Throughout my career, this has always kept me on my feet, on the ground. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Thomas Edison is, I haven't failed. I just found 10,000 ways that won't work. It keeps reminding me that we have, as a design, we need to keep an open mind and a positive thinking. If one of your ideas or concept that didn't work, that's okay. There is always a way out. There must be something you can do. There must be a solution. So if you fail once, that's okay. Just keep trying. So I'll talk a little bit about AKQA. I've been at AKQA for four and a half years. I started there as a um, senior designer. And we are there to actually create a bet better future for the clients and for the users. We have amazing talents in the agency through different departments. We have the data team, we have the strategy team, we have content, we have visuals, we have developers, and we have like UX researchers and UXs. The power of having multidisciplinary departments and we work together is we're combining and utilizing our expert knowledge to create an innovative and meaningful brand experience for our, ex, um, for our clients and to our users. So the values we deliver is service, innovation, quality, and thought. So why are we here? To this topic is data-driven design. We might have touched on it, what it is in the panel, but what actually is data? Nowadays, people would say, Google Analytics. The numbers we get from checking the users, tracking the users, how they interact with um, particular digital products, particularly field, page, or components. User insights that we gather through research, user testing, survey, A-B testing, so on and so forth. But as I was talking to some of you during the break, is this a new thing just came up recently? No, actually it's not. Data-driven design, we actually have been living through it. We, as human beings, we learn from experience, from day-to-day -day life. Then we change our behavior through that. So the data actually is the information we have gathered through and we learn from that and we make a decision to do it or not to do it. For example, the kettle is hot. You know, you touch it once, you know it's hot. If you touch it when it's hot, you get burned. So that's the data, our brain is complex. That's a human being. So you learned it. If you touch it, you get hurt, so you're not gonna do it. That's how our brain tells us because of the data you gather in the past, 
I'm going to design your behavior, tell you, inform you not to make that decision. But other than that, sometimes based on the project or based on the client we have, we have superannuation client, and superannuation is an industry with very complex legislation. So data is not just something we get from Google Analytics or user insights. Sometimes we need to look into the industry news. What's upcoming that may have an impact on the decisions we make for certain product? So we talk about data. So what is design? Design, graphic design, product design, behavior design, service design, social design. There are a lot of different design areas that we can name and that can have an impact by data, with data. I'm just gonna tell a story about my friend. He is not a designer whatsoever. He is an entrepreneur. He's a Japanese. I know him for almost two decades. He lives in Vietnam. But it's interesting to see, even though he's not a designer, but I think the approach he took to do his work is actually data-driven. So he's always into food. So he just expanded his F&B business in Vietnam by opening a new salad bar. So what's the relationship between a salad bar and data-driven design. Because he had been living in there, the, he identified that the raw veggies in Vietnam it actually is not safe to consume in raw. So as a salad lover, you already don't have fresh salad to enjoy with, or you have to buy the ones in the packet. Who knows how long it has been living in that bag for months. So what he did, he identified the problems and opportunities. So there's no safe fresh veggies for the locals to consume. So the opportunity is how can we solve that? There's a need for it, how can we solve that? What he did, he partnered with the professor of agriculture and forest of the large university. They, go, they went to the local farms and inspect their veggies and screen each of the veggies, hand pick them to make sure they're safe to eat, to make sure the quality is there. So basically throughout this process, he's actually partnering with an expert, with a profession to gather the evidence of the local, from the local farm to design his product. And what's his product is a salad that he's gonna to deliver to the consumers. So he has to collect that data to make sure it's safe, it's to the quality, right? So it's interesting, data-driven design doesn't just apply to designers, it can apply to entrepreneur or to different areas. So just to translate that is, we get the evidence-based information, qualitative or quantitative, to identify and understand the problem or the opportunities and user needs. Then design a future-proofing solution to address the needs. What needs? Business needs, user needs. I'm gonna talk you through one of the case study we um, have recently done for our client, um, for Australian Super. Not sure how much you know about Australian Super or have you even thought about it? Because many of us, when we were young, we probably won't touch it until we start working. Um, we have been working with them for a long time and we have redesigned their website, forms, portals, but today I'm just gonna focus on one, is their member join form. And I'm gonna talk through the process we've gone through and the result we received. So prior to our redesign, this is what they have. Just by looking at that, you probably can spot a few issues already. For example, it's not responsive, it looks dated, 
it is long and is without guidance. These are some of the key issues we need to address, but also on top of that, we have data that we receive from the client. They say a lot of the members, they've been calling us and said, we are unable to complete the form. They can't complete the form, why? Because there are certain information we ask within the form, they don't know where to find them, but we are not helping them. We're not telling them where they can find it. So actually less than half of the users are able to complete the form online. A lot of them, they have to go through offline process. Can you imagine how frustrating it is? You have to fill out the paper form, send it to them, and then wait for the response. And this is the redesign form. We identified some of the key issues and we actually make sure that the form is not too overwhelming, make sure it's digestible, make sure we are guiding the user through as they are filling out the form. We structure the form in three different key areas. We give them a trackers, let them know where they're at, so they know how long it would take it would to complete a form. Second, we have the left-hand side reserved for contextual help content. As they are focusing on the form on the right, if there are certain areas, for example, we identify, they can't find out their TFN, or they can't find, um, they don't know where to find the employee ABN. We will prompt them, we design a conversation. We will prompt them, oh, where to find my TFN, or where to find my employee ABN? As soon as they click it, we have the contextual help content appears on the left. So we can help them focus on the right, on the form, without um, actually providing contextual help content on the left and help them focus on the form without asking them to drop off or go offline and come back later. But also we have a save and complete later they provide to the users if they are not ready to complete the form at this stage, they can always resume. And we add on a bit of personalization there because as soon as you saved, we know who you are, we know your name, we know your phone number, so we can follow up. If you don't come back, we can always follow up. Or as soon as you come back, we resume, resume the form. For example, hi Matt, welcome back. This is where you left off. So, Designing a conversation linked to users to the experience, not just present the form to them and say, fill it out, send it back to us. We, that's it, just wait for us. So after we designed, the average performance from previously less than half of the people can complete a form to 60% of the people in average. They could complete a form online. It might not seem a lot, but if you think about it, superannuation is not something people look at every day. 12% average increase is pretty massive. Like 10K people sign up every month, that is huge. But I think the major achievement is, in the first two months, the client actually told us we didn't get any call from our users saying that they can't complete the form. It's like, hooray, we actually have them solve the problem. Instead of the people from the, on the other side and getting a call and say, yeah, this is where you get a TFN, this is where you get an ABN side. They don't have, for the staff-wise, for business-wise, they don't have to do that anymore. For users-wise, they don't have to pick up the phone and complain about your form is shit. <laughs> So how do we get to that process? No, how do we get to that result through this process? So we have gone through different phase. Within AKQA, remember, we create a innovative, meaningful brand experience. We have in-house staff team, so we are full surface. So we go through discovery, design, development, and deploy, so with four different phase. For discovery phase, what we do throughout this project, we didn't get to do the first-hand um, 
research, so we receive secondary research insights from external research agency. We gather all the insights from them, but also look at the Google Analytics they have in-house. We gather all this information as much as we can, we tear them apart, we regroup them, and we understand them. We need to understand what's the problem, where is the opportunity, how we can address it. That's the discovery phase we have to go through. It can be a little bit of a dirty work. As you can see, there are a lot of poster notes, handwriting, and stuff like that. It's always messy. Then we get to a design phase. This is where we can start ideate and design. When you do ideations, let's step away from the screen. Pen and paper, old school, just do some scams, sketches, but make sure whatever we are ideating is mapping back to the user insights. Make sure we are actually addressing something, not something fluff. Then once we ideate, we design either in wires, usually in wires first, then into visuals. Before we hand it over to the developers, ideally we would go through user testing and iteration. So we test the concept, test the ideas, um, and refine it from there. Because without testing it, you don't know whether your concept works or whether you're actually solving problems. This is where we get a qualitative, extra qualitative data to validate our concept. If we don't get the scope to actually do the proper user testing, at least we do corridor testing. Something lean, something quick. You need to get someone out of the project to have a look at it. Because superannuation, everybody is the audience, everybody is the target audience, everybody needs one. So we don't have a specific age restraint. So we can just grab someone on a corridor who's have, who knows nothing about um, products, so they're not an advocate of the brand to do the testing, see whether it works. Once we finalize the concepts, we hand it over to developers. They will start building it. Thanks to the great team, we have an awesome visual design team. They, once they did the visual design, they hand it over to the developers with great details, like every single pixel. This is how wide it is, this is what color we use. This is to ensure the quality of the end product we use building. And before deploy, during the development phase, is this the end of our job? Not really. We're actually sense checking with developers a lot. Um, sometimes developers have questions. Um, they say, oh, we can't build this, or we have certain constraints because of the system. Um, then that's where we have to come in and make minor tweaks, and then deploy. Deploy means we release the end product to the public. But is this the end of our journey? Actually, it's not. After deploying, yes, we release a new form online so the users can get access to it, but we still need to continue monitoring it, the performance, because we are not psychic. <laughs> we can't get to the perfect solution at one goal. We need to keep monitoring it, looking at the data, to identify, identify any single opportunities and implementing the enhancements incrementally just to improve the experience slowly. So this is the main process we do throughout the project, how we design a product through using the data, either it's first-hand or second-hand from client, or even after we have designed it, how do we continue improving it? So, like I said, to them talk about the process and what we have done, talk a little bit about the future. We have touched a little bit on that in the panel. Social scoring. Is this the future? 
I personally think hopefully it's not. But we can't stop how people use that. As the technology evolves, data is so powerful. Data plus technology, this combination is inevitable. But how do we ensure that we are using it in the right way? Nowadays, we, most of the business, or even us, we keep thinking how we can collect more data so we can understand the users better, the problem better, how we can collect more data to identify any opportunities. But have we, think, have we ever thought about how can we protect them? How can we protect them? Social scoring, Chinese government, as a government, you have the, you, you are the most powerful authority within the society, within the country. Of course, you can push this experiment out without much people saying no, because you're not going to change. But by doing that, you need to demonstrate that you are not just creating a class in the society that may lead to a negative outcome because of the class. Not sure if you are into history, but there's always problems that led by having a society class, social class. But as a government or as a designer, when we have so much data in hands, we need to think about, are we actually improving the experience? To other speakers' point, or to what my friends has done, has done, has done in Vietnam, he opened a salad bar. He actually using local farmers' produce to improve locals' livings by providing fresh salads instead of having the packaged ones. He's having a positive impact in the society. He's improving local farmers' life, but also local citizens' life. So by having all this data, we need to remember we're not, we shouldn't be blindly driven by data. Data is always too high. Numbers, just numbers. If you don't know the core problem, why? How did it happen and why? It probably it means nothing. You can easily mis misinterpret that. So instead of data-driven, we should always think about its data-informed design. By knowing all this data, it's actually better inform your decision. And with great power comes great responsibility. I think most of us heard it from Spider-Man, Uncle Ben. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. It is the way to go, there's no doubt. But where is it going? I think we still have control. Thank you, that's me.